You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello Book Talk Today family and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. My name is Orn, I am your host and in today's podcast we are joined by Dan Bigham. Dan is an aerodynamic engineer turned cyclist and is captain of the HUUB What Bike Cycling team and is also director of his own componentry brand. He has worked with many different cycling institutions and is a world record holder in himself. And in today's podcast, we are going to be talking about his new book, Start at the End, How Reverse Engineering Can Lead to Success. And I'm a big fan of athletes and sports people because of their dedication and persistence and discipline towards their field. And the conversation with Dan was a very interesting one because we talked about his experience with cycling, but also his experience with engineering and how you can find the the parallels between the both. I'm someone who proposes or is a proponent of doing multiple different things, whether you be an athlete but also work full time and do other creative projects as well. I'm someone who tries to do as much as possible and the reason why is because you can learn patterns between different ways of thinking even though they're not related and you can turn them and apply them to different things. So in our conversation we discuss Dan's background, how he became interested in engineering but also his passion for cycling as well and how you can find the commonalities between the both and how reverse engineering this process of starting at the end and reverse engineering your way back to find about the processes in order to lead to success is so important and something that we should all be doing as well. So I can't wait to share that conversation with you now. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the podcast. Every single week, we release a podcast with an author to discuss their book and the ideas and principles inside of that. If you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify, the best way to support this channel is to head over to our Book Talk Today channel on YouTube and subscribe over there. That is the free and easy way to support this channel to help grow and get the message out there. Thank you again for watching this podcast, and I really hope you enjoy this episode with Dan. Dan, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's always fun to chat, and uh, yeah, love taking up these opportunities to talk about all the cool things that I've been up to. Yeah, definitely, and related to books. I mean, books is one of those things that I I love, and and I love reading about individual stories relating to sport and goal setting because I think sport and athletic pursuits are really unique in their approach to goal setting and improving performance because. Regular people, obviously, who aren't, aren't professional athletes, they're still professionals in whatever they do, but and they're looking for ways to improve. And I think l- reading about people's experience in sport and being involved in sport is a really interesting way to to optimize and, and, and improve your life. So uh, before we get into some of, the, some of the elements of your book, I'd just love to know a bit more about your story and how you came to, uh, to write this particular book. Uh, yeah, that will, where do I really start? There's kind of a lot of different um, streams that lead into into writing this book. I think first and foremost is my background in engineering. I, I studied most sport engineering. I always wanted to go into Formula One. I, I mean, I still love Formula One, but um, by the time I made it there and I spent just over a year working at Mercedes AMG uh, Petronas back in, this was 2011, 2012. So yeah, a decade ago now. Yeah where I kind of realized as much as I love Formula One, it's not the environment that I wanted to work in. And there was a lot of other things going on in my life around sport and just trying to be more of an athlete uh, that really didn't um, didn't um, fit very well with the the demands of that kind of role. It's, it's very intense, it's long hours, and it's it's stressful at the end of the day. Formula One is, is very high pressured and they want the best people to, to commit to it. But it meant things like night shifts, weekends. I mean, I, I would work like three weeks straight without a week weekend off. And that would be two, maybe two weeks of days and then a week of nights and then transition back. And yeah, it just asked a lot of me. And um, while I was there, I met a, met a guy called Simon Smart, who used to be a Formula One aerodynamicist at Red Bull and then transitioned into the world of cycle sport and that kind of piqued my interest and kind of joined my two passions together, really. And um, I think that's one thing that I learned quite early on that to kind of find your niche is to to kind of find those two unique passions and, and bring them together. And that's what, what cycling and, and aerodynamics really did for me. And I went back to university, I finished up my master's and kind of tweaked a lot of my what should have been motorsport modules towards cycle sport and 
had things like lap time simulators turn into sort of cycling time trial model yeah. simulators and things like that. That when I left university, um, I kind of I just wanted to apply that to my own sport. I was progressing as an athlete. I I sort of competed, I guess, towards a, a good national level. I was starting to get podiums at UCI level, which is kind of guess if you look at division maybe like fourth division is probably the way to think about it fourth and third division level site thing and uh, that was progressing really well I'd, I'd started to understand just how much physics impacts on cycling performance and everything I'd learned through through my degree but also through my time in industry that I could apply and probably make a big leap forward that cycling was stuck 20 years behind mm. where motorsport was and I just saw this glaring opportunity to to really um, take advantage of that and that's when yeah the the whole team kgf who bought bike track cycling team came from really it was um myself convincing a few friends to, to have a go go to the national championships and and see what we could do as uh, as a four-man team pursuit squad and we literally had a handful of weeks training but we all had our own home sort of background and knowledge we weren't sort of 18 year olds coming onto the program we were leaving uni and you know what it's like when you're in that situation yeah. that you're on the Dunning-Kruger curve. Yeah. You're at like the peak of, you think you know everything, but yeah. I mean, we've, we've definitely been in Mount Despair, uh, sorry, the Valley of Despair after that. But um, yeah, yeah we, we took all of the ideas, whether myself and Charlie being engineers, Johnny being a psychologist and, and Jacob being a sports scientist. So mm. really applied those and we went to the national championships and we beat the, the national team. We broke the competition record and that kind of set the wheels in motion for what was an awesome few years of racing at the World Cup team, winning World Cups and, and yeah, beating Great Britain, Denmark, Australia, Italy, all these these top federations yeah, achieving yeah. awesome times. And um, that really led to um, what was going to be our our kind of uh, final hurrah, really. The world governing body decided we weren't welcome anymore competing against all these nations. And uh, we decided we'd go up to altitude and have a go at breaking the world record. Just as a, why not? It's a bit yeah, of fun. Not, we, yeah, yeah. we always enjoyed these challenges. And um, that was pretty much when COVID hit. We were on our final altitude camp. We were at the top of Mount Tidy. And yeah, COVID descended upon us all. And um, yeah, the best laid plans of mice and men and all that. And suddenly we're yeah locked up for, oh, it'll only be two weeks and yeah, two years <laughs> later down the line. But um, that put play to those plans. And I just took it as an opportunity to, to take stock, to, to yeah. think a bit more about those previous three, four, five years and the journey I'd been on and the things that I'd learned. And it, it was very introspective uh, to really look back and to consider that and to try and put it in black and white so that other people uh, in cycling or, or not in, in sport, in business, um, could kind of read my story, read the team story, but also uh, see how that could be applied elsewhere and, and hopefully yeah, bring benefit to others. Yeah, at the beginning of the book, you talked about this idea of knowledge is more important than talent. And and I think in that in your story, uh, that that's prevalent because that experience at Mercedes must have been really quite eye opening for you to see, you know, the level of detail. Like I follow Formula One. So Mercedes is, is my team, obviously, because of Lewis Hamilton, because he's an absolute <laughs> legend. Uh, but it is, must have been such an amazing experience to see the type of dedication and analysis and research that goes into, I think you worked on the, the wing mirror, didn't you? So it must have been amazing to see. Yeah, I spent, I think it was six months on the wing mirror, six or seven months on the wing mirror, and then six or seven months on what's called the diffuser core, uh, the, well, the tire seal. It's kind of the corner of the diffuser, which is such a small part in the grand scheme of things. But um, you can really get, get your teeth stuck into it. And yeah, as, as an environment, there's nothing like it. It's so unique to to learn as an engineer like that. I mean, in some respects, it's it's been detrimental to my engineering career since then because you become so accustomed to an environment where money is no object and time is all that matters. And to try and take a step back on that and actually think a bit more pragmatically, especially in the environment with our track team where it was the complete opposite. We had all the time in the world, but money was, was the biggest <laughs> object. Uh, but you do learn from those things. And the amount, yeah, the, the sheer knowledge, the scientific rigor that, that they approach motorsport with is is definitely unparalleled unparalleled within within any industry that I've come across and there's so much that can be learned and that, that's why people look to it to F1 for inspiration and even now so I work for Ineos Grenadiers now I've only just started a few months ago and thankfully through the Ineos connection we we have a, a good link up with with Mercedes AMG Petronas so uh, yeah I, I definitely will be heading there in the near future to pick some brains and just get some inspiration and, and see what I've missed out on see all the new ideas and there's a lot yeah. of people there who are interested in cycling as well so as soon as they get an opportunity to try and 
get involved in that. I'm sure they'll jump on it. How did you? How do you? Do you how did you deal with that transition then from focusing on a, an environment that was ample amount of money and then a limited amount of time? For instance, for a race weekend, you need to get ready for a race weekend, and it might only be like a week away. To an environment where you don't have the resources, but you have an extended period of time. Like, what were some of the mindset shifts that you had to have personally in order to to combat that? I think the big one is to actually spend a lot of time thinking over problems. The Formula One has that kind of brute force of money because you can just go, well, I don't know what the solution to this is. So I'm just going to buy 10 different versions of this specific component that we're designing. And then we can just test them all because we've got the manpower, we've got the finances. Where when you switch it the other way around, it's okay. We can't go out there and buy every wheel, every tire, every chain ring, every set of handlebars. We've got to think a bit more about actually what, what makes a fast handlebar, what makes a fast wheel, what makes a fast tire, and think more pragmatically, okay, how can we test this, but on a limited budget? How can we design our own test rigs? Just using first principles, break it down. Cycling's quite a, a clean sport in that respect because we can measure power and we can measure speed, and pretty much that's that's your input and your output. So you want to go faster, you can put more power in, but you can look at the relationship between the two. So it's, it's being clever and it's spending a lot more time thinking, taking a step back, looking at the, the whole problem and going, okay, well, we want to improve this. How important is that metric? How important is this other metric? And then kind of, you can divvy up your time, divvy up your effort, but then also go out there and find the people who've been through that or are looking at the exact same problem and try and utilize their knowledge, try and bring them on board. There are a lot of people, especially in the sports science world, who have some amazing research that never has true impact at elite level, uh, especially at nations sort of, well, yeah, European championships, world championships, Olympics. It's very, very hard to ha- get access to those athletes unless you suddenly find the silver bullet to athletic performance. But it's never a silver bullet. It's always small little details. So we went out there and, and searched for these intelligent people who wanted to have impact with their research and say, well, look, we're competing at the same level. We want to get fast really quick. We, we're not worried about the Olympics. We're not, we can't go. We won't go. We're not going to get selected or highly unlikely. Um, so, yeah, can we can we provide a platform for, for you to do something really cool? And that was just another way, at least on the energy inside, to really access a lot of good information that would otherwise take many years and a whole lot of effort to, to get our hands on. And suddenly people are, are loving it because we really buy into it. And we had a great interest in that side as well. And I think there's a lot to be said when you build that relationship up. And I think it's the same when anybody shows a great interest in your passion, then suddenly you really pour your heart into it and you, you want them to win. And I think that relationship was was a good one. And we built it up with many different practitioners in different areas. I think that is a really interesting point, though, because in, in the book, you touch upon teamwork and the importance of teamwork and finding the right people to, to fit that gap. So I think when you talked about your experience with your your team and, and getting the guys together, it seems like your diverse backgrounds sort of complemented one another. And it's sort of finding the the the, the last piece in the jigsaw puzzle is, is it's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? It is. And I definitely agree that we complemented each other. It was a good environment for just positive criticism and being constructive with it because we all didn't know the finer details of each other's areas of expertise, but we were very willing to either learn or critique. So there were a lot of effectively classroom sessions of, okay, it was very informal. We were living together and training together. So you could literally just be chatting over dinner or breakfast or got some free time and you end up talking about who knows what tire roll resistance or Johnny and about psychology or yeah, all these different areas. And um, it meant that you could kind of identify your own blind spots that obviously you're blind too. You don't know that they exist because you sort of work around them and suddenly someone goes, okay, well, you said this and you've said that, but you haven't considered these things then. And you go, ah, oh, yeah, that's a great point. And then suddenly it blows open a whole new area of, of things to go and look at. And I think having a load of people who are willing to go through that process um, and to make each of us better. And it, it wasn't just from um, a knowledge perspective as well. There was a lot of openness and willingness to take constructive criticism about the things that we were doing because we only had four, four people as a four man team. The team dynamics were very different to what you would normally get in say a, a national federation where four guys are going to ride or four women are going to ride, um, but you might have six, seven, eight people going for that slot. So if you're going for that slot, are you going to point out that so-and-so maybe their position's not quite right, their nutrition's not quite right, they're not training perfectly, yeah. there's a bit of a flaw here or a bit of a flaw there. Of course not. Like, there's there's some inherent selfishness there. 
Whereas in a team where there's just four of you all pulling in the same direction, then all those flaws are, are called out for what they are. And okay, it's not always the nicest thing when they're going, <laughs> what the hell are you doing that for? And you go, uh, yeah, that's a really good point, actually. But it's it's helpful. And I think that environment was very unique and mm. enabled us to all just continue to to get to the level we needed to be very quickly because yeah, we didn't have years on our side to, to really make that progress. Yeah, but you all have to be open and, and willing to listen to one another because even in that environment, even if there's just the four of you, it can still get to a point where you don't, perhaps take that on because you might have an idea about I don't know maybe like established ways of thinking about yourself so you still have to be open for that type of criticism yeah I think we all have our own identity don't we or believe this is this is who I am and everybody else has a different opinion of, of who you are and sometimes yeah that criticism isn't so welcomed and as well you can justify your own decisions and say well I understand where you're coming from however this is my logic and this is what I feel and a lot of cycling as well is um, around your perceptions and you, and you respond a lot to how you perceive things, not what's actually happening. I mean, on a very sports science level, for example, there's plenty of studies that say you don't have to ingest carbohydrates for your body to respond and say carbs are coming on board. You can literally swill them in your mouth, spit them in the bin, and you get the exact same response up okay. to a certain point. So it's much the same as well that you would respond to, okay, well, I feel like this session is helping me. Therefore, it is helping me. I think that if I sleep at this time of day and I feel better for it, whether the science says so or not, at the end of the day, the proof in the, uh, proof is in the actual, uh, what's the saying I'm trying to get out? It's effectively when you, when you go and actually do it and you get the result out, it's like, well, okay, this, this isn't what study X, Y or Z said. However, yeah, yeah. it's worked for me. And it's yeah, trying, yeah. To, trying to bounce up that scientific rigor versus just listening to your body, listening to the things that, that do matter. Um, but I think we were generally just quite open in that respect. Um, that there, was, there was definitely a, a trade-off and having good morale as well, that you can't always do all these perfect things that science or research or smart people tell you should do because you're a human being, right? You can't live like a robot. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, plenty of elite level and Olympic champions do live like robots, but I wanted to enjoy life. And I think we were all in the same boat in that respect, that we wanted to have fun and that we couldn't just structure team pursuit training sessions for pure physiological gains. We had to have fun. Like yeah. A lot of the sessions that Johnny would set would literally be structured around making sure specific guys, especially if morale was down. So if Jacob's not doing well or I'm not doing well or Charlie isn't, then how can we change that session around to try and tweak it to make them feel a bit better? That, oh, maybe I'm not going as bad as I thought at this time. And okay, maybe it's people would say, well, that's cheating because you're, you're creating this false environment. But actually, if it brings their morale up enough that the next few sessions they do, turn they turn a corner and their form is on the up. So there's kind of that fake it till you make it kind of thing, yeah. but in a, quite a constructed way and the team being aware of each other and, and what state they're in. How do you deal with the... I, I've always wanted to ask a professional athlete this question. It's like, how do you deal with wanting to push yourself in training and to improve and make those marginal gains in training sessions leading up to a competition, but not going so far as to fatigue yourself to make sure that you're not at peak condition for the actual competition? Like, what is your process and how do you think about improving on each session because you want to be improving each day you want to be making marginal gains but at the same time you don't want to be overtraining. yeah it's a knife edge and I think everyone deals with it differently I think my motivation and it's going to sound really nerdy has always been about trying to find ways to be quicker off minimal effort and at some point I have to train obviously I can't just <laughs> stand around and be like I'm so aero I don't have to ever ride you have to visualize to you have visualize aerodynamics <laughs> <laughs> I'm so narrow. Yeah, um, and people laugh and joke that uh, it was one thing that we said that we could find improvements that would obliterate any training gains you could ever make in a year. You could do it in an afternoon if you got lucky, but you want to work on both sides of the coin. You can't just polish one up and expect the other to be totally fine. So, yeah, I I struggled with motivation for training for big competitions if I don't also have technolo technology on my side to be working on, whether that's, oh, okay, if I tweak a bit of this or that or the other or work on a new component or a new design or do some testing to just improve my position, then I just feel like I'm not making progress on the technical side. Uh, where some people feel the exact other way. And, and Johnny, yeah. for example, is quite happy to take a step back on that let the, the techie nerdy people work on the techie nerdy stuff and then he can really focus on his training and he's quite um unique in many respects and one of his his approaches to training is 
and he analogizes it to uh, a chef making um, making food at a restaurant, which is interesting considering he used to work in a mission side restaurant. But he goes to uh, goes to the shop and finds out what fish is fresh on that day and goes, oh, I'm going to cook that. And he does the exact same thing every morning. He wakes up and he goes, how do I feel today? Hmm, okay, I'm going to go for a bit of this. And he has a, a loose structure of his plan, but it means that he can, can judge himself and just say, okay, I feel like I'm in a good place. And it might be halfway through a ride. He has to completely change that. And it's, it's quite a pragmatic approach. But yeah, it's it's uh, erratic at the same time, whereas I'm a bit more on the uh, very planned out uh sort of structured approach where I leave it to somebody else. In my case, it's Jacob Tipper, my teammate, a coach now as well, who uh, literally sets the sessions and pretty much stick to it. I have a, a bit of wiggle room, as it were, to say, okay, well, today I wasn't doing so quite so well, so I can knock it back a bit. Or if you're feeling good, you can tag on an extra effort or another half an hour of zone two at the end. And yeah. um, I think I have a good perception of how I'm going at any given time. And there are a few, not maximal efforts, but efforts that I can judge my sort of rate of perceived exertion on that I know if I'm going well I could I can sustain this for two hours three hours four hours and my heart rate will be at this kind of level and um, it's it's a nice way to prepare for competition because you know that even though it's not a maximal all out let's see what I've got for five minutes or 20 minutes it's okay well actually if I can complete this and I can sit and watch Netflix the entire thing feel comfortable then actually I'm probably in a very good aerobic physiological state which when you come up to altitude where I am now in Andorra suddenly everything changes because your altitude, the partial pressure of oxygen is reduced, your power goes down, your heart rate goes up and all those barometers that you've built over years as an athlete go out the window (laughs) and you have to reestablish them. So the past week I've I've done a lot of training that is at a much lower level than I I otherwise would do, but I do them very progressively to say, okay, well, if I keep pushing myself, how do I respond to this? How do I respond to another 10 watts? How do I respond to going a little bit longer or just trying to understand where my body is at altitude because this is going to be more of a baseline for me now. And yeah, having lost those mm. those metrics, those barometers that I've had uh, down at sea level, then it's it's a bit of a weird one as an athlete going into a major competition and not quite knowing where you're at, but you hope. Yeah, you hope. And, and do you like document each session and document your rate of exertion like on a scale to make sure that if you look back in a year and you say to yourself, oh, you know, these are the things that I did in order to get to that position in a competition, then you can at least go back and, and have a log of how you got to that position. Yeah. Uh, so all my sessions from from the energy outside were all logged to so everything from my power, my torque, cadence, the speed I was riding out, my altitude, heart rate, even things like core body temperature now. So there's some really cool things that you log and that that's all stored in quite a cool database. So you can look at the relationships of them and how they trend over time. Uh, And then, yeah, you start to add a lot more metadata of late. So things like how did the session feel? Was it good, bad? Uh, How did you feel mentally as well? So not just the rate of perceived exertion, but did you go into the session feeling mentally fatigued? Were you really motivated? And just trying to tie those in um, over time. I'd say I don't look too much back nowadays. I've um, mostly got to a point where I know what I should do on any given day based on how I'm feeling. And you get a good handle on that. Whereas, yeah to be able to look back when you're in that kind of growth phase of saying, well, okay, I probably shouldn't be training if my heart rate variability is low and my morale is really low and mm. I got on and everything was, was terrible. Forcing yourself through those sessions largely is probably not a benefit. And um, it takes some time to, to, I guess, mature as an athlete to understand that you don't have to put yourself through the, through the grinder every single day and that some days can be easy and some days you can just float through them and they're fine and some days are going to be hard and, it's knowing on those hard days when you should push on and when you should just take a step back and, and what's causing that fatigue or what's causing the other things. And I struggle with the balance. And I think a lot of people do, especially with the fact that I've got a job alongside me trying to be an athlete, that yeah. there's other stresses and worries that I could wake up and know that, okay, well, I've got 10 hours of work to do today. And the, my training plan says I've got to ride my bike for four hours. Well, <laughs> if, I want to, if I want to get nine hours of sleep, nine and a half hours of sleep, then there's not much time for much else in the day, really. And then it's figuring out when do you do that so that you're not in a totally mentally fatigued state that you can't get a good session, but equally you get your work done and you're not so tired for work. And there's a lot of plates to be to be spun. Um, and I guess that's where being a full-time elite athlete is, is definitely beneficial. But um, I'm... I'm too much in love with the engineering to give that up really. How do you, I would love to know how you go about planning your time and making sure that you're optimizing your work, but also optimizing your performance. Because like someone like me, 
I work full time. I do this podcast. I do content creation, but I also like to work out. I know I like to, I have my own goals physically and athletically. And I'd love to know, like, what's your process to make sure that you're peaking for your training sessions, but also making sure that you're not fatigued for work, because that happens to me. Like I work out in the mornings and I try and push myself, but then I get to the stage where it's like one o'clock in the afternoon and I'm just I'm lagging big time. <laughs> I'm lagging big time. Like what's your approach? Is it like nutrition? Is it um, supplementation? Like what is your personal routine? So there's a few different things I do. I'd say firstly, I have a, a lot of periodization around the training that I do. So ahead of major competitions, so for example, national track champs is quite literally two weeks away today. So right now I, I focus heavily on training as much as I physically can. So that's my priority in my day. So I fit my training where my training should be based on the weather or what I need to be doing. So for example, today is a split day. So first thing I'm up, I'm on the trainer, I get my session done. I can focus during the day on the other things that I want to do. And then this evening I've got a plan to get on and and train then and then my work I just fit around it and I'm quite lucky working for a world world tour cycling team that they're aware of that and they support me in my training and yeah. know there's times where I'm going to be focused on training and there's times where my training takes a, a significant backseat and I could be traveling all around the world going to all manner of races so for example back in sort of December and January and even into February a little bit that my training was playing second fiddle to my work and my work would be the priority I'd be on training camps where the riders are quite literally doing five, six hours a day. And if anything, I'm doing 10, 12, sometimes more hours of work. And I squeeze a few sessions in here and there, but I accept that it's kind of give and take in that respect. And then, yeah, alongside of it is a lot of, a, a lot of it is focused around the nutrition. So even things like caffeine, when do you take your caffeine throughout the day? So right now, yeah, literally just had a coffee now because I know in half an hour or so's time I'm getting on the train and I want to make sure that I'm in a good mental state and feel awake and I'm ready to train. Uh, beyond that nutrition, there's nothing I'd say wild that I do. I try to avoid, uh, I guess, promoting that uh, supplements are the way forward because I don't think they really are. I think supplements are a, a stopgap or a kind of filler for bad nutrition in general that you should yeah. try and hit all your, your nutrient targets through your, your diet full stop. So I guess that then comes down to how much you periodize your carb intake. So if you're doing a big day, so tomorrow I'll be out on the road for probably five hours. So tonight, definitely getting some carbs on board because I need to be pretty well fueled for that yeah. session. But then conversely, if I'm going to have an easy day, a rest day, then carbs aren't going to be a thing. And then it's just making sure that you feel full throughout, but you're not having too many excess calories. Um, I think beyond that, I just I do have regular blood tests just to keep on top of the fact I'm going up to altitude, down to sea level. I have a lot of stress in my life as well to make sure I try and balance it and just keep on top of things that maybe uh, I may be deficient in. So, I mean, a good one is vitamin D. I recently had a blood test and unsurprisingly, you haven't spent a lot of time inside throughout winter and completely just didn't think about it. I'm deficient in it and it's just a glaring, well, there you go. You've probably got a bit of performance there. Um, beyond that, Omega, uh, yeah, omega threes, uh, and sometimes probiotics, prebiotics, uh, especially in kind of stressful times because your stress tends to hit your gut pretty hard. So if you can keep on top of that um, when you're yeah under load, then that can be quite a, a good thing for making sure that you absorb all those nutrients. But I don't think there's anything wild day to day that I can say this is the silver bullet and it's going to change your life because I think yeah, most of it just comes from good food. It's interesting you say that because it seems as if most athletes or people who um, focus on optimizing performance don't focus too much on the supplementation i don't know where it comes from from a marketing point of view to to focus on these supplementations to to let's say the general population but it doesn't seem like a lot of athletes really rely on that supplementation factor so it's interesting i wonder where that comes from i think it must be a marketing thing it's quite uh focused towards those who want quick wins i guess because you you can't commit to the what is effectively a long, hard grind. It's, you've got to do a lot of training volume and you've got to eat well consistently. And a lot of people can't do that because they have busy lives. So they have to, for want of a better phrase, take shortcuts. They have to say, okay, well, I can't do that training volume. I can't make great food for three meals a day. Therefore, what can I do to try and mitigate that impact? And I think in that scenario, maybe it's not such a bad thing, but it's still, I would, I would argue and say, try to create an environment where you naturally can do that and you can eat a good diet and that you can train as much as you feel you need to rather than going, okay, well, I'm going to sleep less and just take this supplement to make sure that I feel awake for my work because that, that'll catch up on you. Sleep is recovery at the end of the day. 
and um, yeah, I think that's probably where it's where it's come from. I think I think it's the expectation. Like uh, recently on the podcast, we had this author called David Robertson. He wrote this book called The Expectation Effect, and in that book, he talks about this idea that you know someone could get, let's say, for instance, six hours sleep, but if they feel as if their six hours of sleep is beneficial and they get their recovery, they'll feel a lot more better than someone who gets eight but feels like they haven't got enough. So I think that gap between how you feel about the things that you do, whether it be food or recovery or your training, like like you said, I think how you feel about it is almost more important than what you specifically do. Yeah, you respond to how you how you perceive rather than what's actually happening. Exactly that. It's um, it's a really common thing. It's it's quite surprising, but yeah, it's setting those uh, targets, I guess, that you're happy that you've hit them, and that's that's what's that's achievable. And yeah, sleep's quite an interesting one because it's so variable and its impact on on your body's response. Heart rate variability is actually quite a good measure of that. Yeah. It's probably one of the only things that I'd say all these different um, straps and rings and everything else that you can get nowadays to measure all manner of things really tells you that okay, if your heart rate variability is going up or down, it's actually a pretty good marker of how well you're recovering. Like there. overtraining, is it overtraining for heart rate variability, isn't it? So you do it in the mornings and you can see where it spikes, so you know you're overtrained. Yeah, overtraining or under-recovering, because effectively it's the same thing at the end yeah. of the day. So if you're going to bed late or drinking alcohol, actually, is one of the worst things, um, and you can see it clear as day if you, if you ever track it, it take your resting heart rate goes up, your respiration rate goes up and your heart rate over that it goes down. So unsurprisingly, you're not recovering because yeah. <laughs> you've had a few beers the night before. Yeah. Um, but it's an interesting one to see and it, it reinforces and if anything, it can change your relationship. And I think that's actually one of the best things that can come out of all these activity trackers. And I'm not a big advocate for them, but they can be that big kick that you need because often just reading an article or your coach saying, go to bed earlier, do this, do that, do the other, doesn't always work. Whereas if you look and you, you spent I don't know, 400 pounds, whatever they might be on a, on a whoop or an aura or whatever, and it's saying, go to bed earlier, you're not recovered today, you're not recovered today. And it's just, it's a nudge that actually you start to listen to. And my coach Jacob's really open about it, that actually all the metrics that it tracks and gives you, okay, there, there is some grounding in them, but maybe they're not hugely useful. But the big thing for him is just, you went to bed late, you're not recovered. And it just reminds him, he's like, okay, I know we need to go to bed earlier. And it, and it works. It's just a very expensive nudge. <laughs> I, I, need that. I think my, my apprehension with it is one of those things that like when I was, when I was a bit younger, I was really into playing golf and I was majorly into like the technology behind it and optimizing my loft and attack angles when I used to hit to make sure that you're getting the reduction of spin, but you're getting the right launch angle so you can optimize everything. So for carry and all that types of stuff. But then I got to the stage where it kind of, the data becomes so overwhelming that you can't focus on the simplicity aspect because something like golf, it's a very complicated sport in the sense that there's so many factors that go into it. And the more information I was taking in, the harder it was to actually play the game, like, because you, you want to be mentally clear. So like from your perspective, how do you take in data, store that data, reflect on that data, but at the same time, keep your mind free so you can actually perform at your best? I think you have to structure a time and a place for when that data is being presented to you and when it's useful. So we went through a big phase of well, firstly, trying to understand what we need to measure, what's important uh, and what what isn't, and even to the point of generating our own metrics. So to, to kind of explain our event and in a little more detail for those who aren't aware of what track cycling is. So the event that we raced is the four kilometer team pursuit. So you have four riders and you have to cover four kilometers as quick as you can. The intent is to try and catch the other team, but I'd say that happens maybe 1% of the time because we're so well well uh, balanced so then it's the third rider over the line so you've kind of got this unique aspect as well that you could drop a rider but effectively you've got free reign to how how you utilize those guys and how you optimize them um, from a physiological perspective you want to be as fit as you can so you want a big aerobic um, capacity but you want a big anaerobic tank as well mm. um, so you're kind of balancing the the two sides there throughout training and and nutrition and yeah there are some supplemental interventions that you may do on race days like sodium bicarb and then the other side is the the energy out. And that's where I guess I get excited. So it's then, okay, you can measure the power that's going in. We are on our cranks, on our crank sets, we, we measure the torque and the angular velocity so we can calculate the power. And then all that energy goes somewhere, can't be destroyed. It's it's quite nice in that respect. So then you can start to understand, well, okay, we, we have about 3% goes to our drivetrain and then actually about 5 
percent or so goes to our tires um, when we're accelerating quite a bit actually goes into kinetic energy storage but when you're up to speed pretty much everything is aerodynamic drag 90 95 percent aerodynamic drag so it's obviously the one to focus on and the metric that matters for that is what's called cda coefficient of drag times frontal area and then you can you can measure that quite simply once you understand where all these where the energy is going as you're riding so it's pretty much measuring that but then when you start to add in the fact it's not just one rider you've got four guys then you start to think, okay, well, what's happening in the line? You can't just ride any position because then you use more energy. So then it's, okay, how we, we all have our fixed positions, but how close do you ride? Do you ride slightly to the side? Do you ride really tight on the wheel, but your head is, is much higher than it probably should be? Uh, and then trying to create an objective measure. So uh, we had multiple things that came out. We, we could obviously me- measure power and speed and cadence. And then we said, okay, what's to CDA? That's our aerodynamic measure. We want to put as much power in, but we want as little drag as we can. The ratio of the two defines how quick you go. And then the other metric we came up with was draft speed, which is effectively how much you can reduce your airspeed by when you're riding in the wheels. So you get less drag in each position. And it was a really, really useful metric for comparison between riders to say, okay, well, that's really good on the front you're hitting your what's the cda but actually when you're in man two and man three your airspeed is much greater than when another rider is so you're probably losing quite a bit there and you could put a number on it and say if you rode as well as this other person is doing so we know it's possible then you could actually have another 10 watts for when you ride on the front and then that means we're going to go a bit faster so instead of just focusing in that let's get as aero as we can, as much power as we can. It's actually a bit more around the execution and then start to look at strategy. But all of this was built mostly around a training session so that we're all doing it when we could focus on the numbers and think about the numbers. And that was the priority of, we want to get fitter. We want to analyze how we're pacing our efforts. We want to analyze how aerodynamic we are and how efficient we are as a team and then optimize and dial that in in a training session. Then you get to competition and it's all about the execution. Mm. So we're, we're worried less about how aero we are, the power that we're putting out. It's just riding nice and smooth, riding well on the line. So we actually removed a lot of those metrics when we went to competition just to kind of clean the entire thing up and make sure we focused on the things that mattered, which was basically how we execute. Because at that point, you can't change your physiology, mm. you can't change your equipment, you can't change your position. All that you can focus on is those controllables of executing the race well and what what goes into that and that's that's pretty much how we went about it so loads of focus and training really understand the numbers make sure everybody gets that as quick as actionable as you can gets competition the bare minimum required to to really execute and do the best you can do in that transition then is it about getting a feeling for what is the right thing to do because so much of it from your perspectives about the data and optimizing the data from those those measurements you just talked about but is it an also like a feeling thing in the sense that you want to know how you felt in training what the right thing to do in training because when you're obviously on the bike in a competition you can't see the numbers but you know what the right like i i can only talk about my experience like when i used to play like golf it was like you know what the feeling is when you're swinging like you you might not know the position or you might not know the angles but you know what the feeling is yeah, the perception in your case, yeah, you, you know exactly that this is a good swing, and you don't, you couldn't, you couldn't say what's happening, right. but you know. And it, to us, it is the same in competition in cycling. You don't. Okay, I, I'm a bit probably a bit weird, a bit niche in that I have a good understanding of what's happening in the race, so I know how many laps each rider's done and whether they've had a bad line or whatever. And I'm, I'm quite good and perceptive at picking that up. But for my own performance, then yeah, you can often just say. There's nothing I know I'm specifically doing right or wrong, but it's a good one. And when I did did the well, broke the British hour record back in in October last year, that was one of those days where I wasn't particularly focusing on all these little details, but I just knew it was it was coming together, and it mm. was, things weren't going wrong. Things were going right. I was doing the right thing. I was in control. And it, yeah, it's it's a hard one to really put your finger on. And those are kind of the days, at least on those more long controlled events where you really have to modulate your effort that those good days where things just happen and that the pain isn't intolerable it's if anything it's quite kind of that sweet enjoyable pain as weird <laughs> yeah. as that is to say yeah like the, the days you dream of as an athlete when it's the big day, the big races and you come there and it all kind of comes together and you don't have to worry about the numbers and i think um yeah if you have to revert to looking at what a number is on a screen, the power output you're doing, then you're probably in the situation where you're questioning every, those decisions that you inherently make. And ideally it's, it's worthwhile pushing away from them. And um, 
I think my opinion on this has changed over time. I used to be very focused on, okay, pacing is critical. And we know that if we pace it well, then we'll, we will go faster for the same amount of effort. However, to focus on a number takes a lot of mental effort, mental fatigue. And I think a lot of it should come from natural ability to tr- so train that, train that in, in practice. And, and then when you come to competition, you pace well because you're very good at naturally pacing, not because you can look at a number on a screen and react to a number. Kind of take that conscious uh, intervention out and just do it subconsciously and naturally. And I think that's where a lot of the good athletes really come to their own. They go into that kind of flow state where they don't have to think, they just do. And I think that's that's the dream, really. I think so much of that comes with time and experience, though, because you need to have that like data bank. You need to have that experience of the training logs. You need to have other competitions that you've done to know how you've made perhaps those mistakes in the past. Like it's very difficult for someone to optimize if they don't have any experience. Like how can someone optimize their cycling if they've done it for four weeks? <laughs> like there's no optimization <laughs> happening in a four week period, but over a 10 to 15 year period, optimizations can happen and and perhaps improve performance mm, that's i think that's why a lot of child prodigies you see them fall apart quite drastically at some major competitions because they they come to a, a situation that they haven't seen before they're unfamiliar they don't know how to respond how to react and to that point they've just they've got there through sheer talent and skill and everything that's natural to them but they don't know how to react so suddenly they go ah, what do i do and they what's that whole fight flight or freeze and mm. it all can fall apart very quickly and um, there's a lot of cyclists like that, that oh, in cycling in general, is, they've got this wealth of talent coming through in the sort of teens really nowadays. So people like Remco Evenepoel, who are just outstanding athletes, but they make some glaring mistakes because they don't have that that wealth, that bank of knowledge they've built up over years and decades of, of racing and training. And yeah, it can, it can be a problem, but you can fast track that at the same time. You can create environments where they can learn, where they will fail. And I think that's a good thing as well. And you've got to learn from those really quickly. You've got to have those environments where you're exposed and you do something wrong and you learn from it because if not, you'll carry on doing the same old thing. And then it could be 10 years down the line, you end up in that situation and you're at the Olympic final and you go, Oh no, then what? (laughs) I think that's where a good coach or just any good practitioner is aware of where those, those flaws, those, those issues lie and tries to create environments that, that stress them to, to make them understand and make them improve those. How much of your training is focused on that mental aspect of either visualization or reflecting or being present? Uh, I think in the book, you talked about the importance of just being present in general. Like how much of your training is it just about being mentally free and, and, and as clear as possible? So I think it's something that I naturally do during sessions in general. So I think a lot about what's coming up in the future, I, just in general day to day, whenever I have free time, which... I guess free mental time for me is when I'm on the bike. I think a lot there and yeah. um, thinking more towards, yeah, what, what's coming up? What's that competition going to be? What what do I need to do to continue preparing? Like yeah, we'll talk, go back to this national track champs in two weeks. So my last few sessions, I spent a lot of time thinking, okay, well, I need to make sure I've got all this equipment packed, but then I need to make sure that my t- nutrition styled and what am I going to do for a warm up? What bike am I going to do it on? What should my warm up be structured like? What what's my pacing going to look like? Yeah. Who, who how am I going to ride this? What are the things I'm going to think about? And just bit by bit visualize it. And I don't think it's something that. I was ever particularly taught, but I think naturally I, I always did quite well. And it was something um, even back at university. So I, I was on a sort of sports scholarship there for triathlon, actually, back at Oxford Brooks. And uh, we had access to a sports psychologist there. And one of the big things that he said, look, I don't need to help you with is the preparation for competition. You seem to really do that quite well. And I think, um, yeah, spending time just understanding what I'm going into and having that familiarity is it's really helpful so that, yeah, you're, you're present, you're in a flow state, you don't have to think or worry or, or f- do anything really. You just, you turn up and you execute and that's all that you can, all you have to worry about. And I think it's, it's a good thing to do. It's just very hard to do for multiple events. And I think that's why I've, I've struggled to have consistent top performances because if I'm going to compete at, I don't know, it could be a race in Australia, a team pursuit there and I come back and I might have track at the end of January, then I'm on the road, then I've got some time trials, then some road races, and you can't put that level of effort as an athlete, at least in my situation where I have a job and everything else, into every competition to go into it fully prepared from that mental state to know exactly what I need to do to win that bike race. Mm. So I, I do pick and choose, and I'm, I'm very happy to be in that situation where I can say, okay, there's maybe five races this year that I want to win, 
and this is how I'm going to approach each one. And I can spend a lot more time thinking about it that way rather than worrying. Like most world tour guys do, they, they could have 70 race days in a year. Wow. Like, <laughs> I'd fall crazy. apart. I wouldn't know where to start. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah. So if you think every every week you're doing one or two races, yeah. you can't put the time and the effort into it, which is, is why within world tour, they pay other people to do that, which is part of what my job is, is to to tell everybody, okay, this is how you're going to pace this race. This is the helmet you use. This is the gears you're going to use. This is the wheels you use. This is the tire pressure you'll run to answer those questions for them. And they have to put their entire faith in me. But fortunately, I don't have that person to do that role for me. So I've got to do it anyway. So I need how to, does it, to be how intelligent. Does it, how does it feel to be on both sides of the fence though, being the person who does ride the bike and does compete, but also being the person who does all that optimizations for other athletes? Because you must be in a unique position being on both sides. Yeah, I think I, there, are, there are very few who yeah do both still at the same level. I think there are a lot who are in my role who have retired yeah. and then gone into that. But uh, yeah, to still be, I guess, a racing athlete. I mean, a lot of the guys that I work with, I, I race against as well. Like last year, for example, at the World Championships, I think I beat three or four of the guys that I'm now trying to make faster. So I'm making my life harder. But uh, to be honest, I'm all in for that. I, I thoroughly enjoy helping people. And it's one of the big motivators for me, especially in a team environment where you feel like, they value it. It's it's something that I, I throw my whole heart into, and to be honest, it helps me get faster as well. That just because I, I let's say I do some tire testing and I find a really fast tire and I give it to a load of my competition, effectively within the team, but then I also get the same tire and I get to go faster. So we all move mm. forward by, by the same amount, and um, yeah, it's it's a weird dynamic at times, um, but I think also it's quite a good one because all of these these uh, racers or athletes, they're not sitting there going, I don't quite believe you because you're just some, you're just an engineer or just a scientist or just a whatever, because they then go, well, hold on, actually, yeah, you were out riding with us and then you raced me the other week and beat me or, or pretty close, or whatever it might be. It kind of gives a bit more um, weight behind my opinions yeah. and my thoughts. And I think they buy into it as well because they, they just, they say I'm an athlete as well. And they've seen the things that, that I've been up to and, um, I'm just, I'm very open. I'm quite happy to, to sit down and talk to them and explain the maths and the physics that underpin it all and try and put it into their terminology as well. I think that's something that historically the the engineers and the scientists and the, in most teams actually have struggled to say, they, they talk in yeah watts and meters squared CDA and all this kind of stuff. Whereas actually you want to talk with an athlete, you've got to talk in their terms, something that yeah. they, they understand. And it's to, to kind of explain that to them and, and yeah, just try and be, um, a bit more on their level. How, how do you manage your individual goal setting? I know in the in the part of the book you talked about like the importance of goal setting and the whole book's about reverse engineering. And you mentioned this uh, this story with Warren Buffett about the 25-5 rule, which I've heard previously. But as someone who works and is an athlete and is managing the whole schedule, like what's your approach to how you set your goals as someone who has multiple ish interests in, in multiple different fields? It's a hard one, but that that rule of of cutting off the bottom, however many, is is incredibly useful. Yes. Because I, I do set, I historically I've set a lot of goals. Mm. I remember back in, I think it was two thousand and fourteen, maybe maybe it was fifteen. I can't remember. I, I put on Facebook on as everyone does, first of January. This is my plans for the year, and it was. I look back and I'm like, wow, <laughs> there was some ambition there for sure. But it was like <laughs> 20 races that I was going to go and win. And I was like, how did I ever expect to go and achieve this? And I, looking back, I'm like, great, you had the ambition, but you didn't execute. And I think over time, I've learned that, yeah, you need to distill it down into the things that really mean something to you. Yeah. Uh, and it's one thing that I explained to, to Rod Ellingworth, who's our, he's basically the head of Ineos Grenadiers when we're, we're basically setting my calendar for the year and I said well look I, I literally want to achieve the best that I can ever do and I'm 30 now and like some of the guys in the team are 19 <laughs> they've got 10 11 years on me I'm I'm heading towards the back end of my career even though I feel like I haven't been in the sport that long so the things that I want to do are, are big and they, they're going to challenge me and some of them I'll probably fail at but I just want to go all in to try and do something pretty pretty crazy, which is why the hour record came about. I was there at Bradley Wiggins' original hour record in, in 2015. I'd literally just started riding track a couple of weeks after it. So as as I was, he, he was finishing up his track career and I was, I was starting mine. It was kind of like, that'd be really cool to be, be at that record and then beat it. And uh, it was one that lingered for years and just you kind of make progress all the time and then you go back to it and it was like, yeah, okay, now's the time to, to do that. And I felt... 
the same with a lot of my other goals that I've set. They've always been a bit lofty, but it was like, you know what, let's try. Like you can set really mediocre goals that are very, very achievable, or you can set really lofty, ambitious ones that are going to push everything that you can do. And yeah, quite often we have failed. We haven't always won all the World Cups we set out to to win. I haven't won always the national championships I've gone out to try and win, but I've definitely tried. Whereas I could have easily said, yeah, the goal is to get on the podium. It's like, well, you can get on the podium, that's fine. But you really want to stretch yourself. So I tend to, yeah, pick out a lot of the big ones. So in this case, it's the Commonwealth Games, the World Championships and the World Hour Record. They're like my three big ones this year. Okay. And they're, they're for different motivators as well. So the Hour Record is to see what I can personally do. So what what is the best that I can be for one hour on the track? And that, that was always a big motivator. It's, it's the balancing of both sides of the equation to do the best physiological performance you can and the best technical performance you can mm. pull them together and that that's what makes you go far in our record so that that's kind of the personal one the world championships for me is the other side of it actually how good am i against the best in the world so instead of just saying how good can i be against the clock how good can i be when i when i do race against Felipe Garner, Wout Bernard, all these top level world tour athletes when i focus on one event am i comparable am i a long way off and just again it's about personal execution but it's about measuring yourself against those and then the commonwealth games is more about something that um i I wouldn't say it means a huge amount to me as an event but i didn't have a great experience in 2018 at the commonwealth games i think um those memories linger and they're, they're motivating for sure and i kind of feel like there's uh unfinished business with the commonwealth games from there that i want to go back and and put right and it's probably not a good thing to be motivated by, but it is something for me that personally I feel like a lot of my family backed me for that and I didn't perform as I should have done, rightly or wrongly, whether I was, well, in some respects, I wasn't given access to the events that I felt I could have performed in, but that's that's a whole other story. But um, I want to go to the Commonwealth Games this year and show what I'm capable of and, and yeah, do my parents proud. Like my mum travelled out to Australia and she had a lot, an absolute, well, my mum and, and a good friend, Becky, as well. She came out, my physio, and... Um, they had a nightmare getting out there. They got out there and, yeah, I got pulled from the team pursuit. I had a pretty terrible ride in the individual suit. I was pulled from the individual time trial as well. And I was like, this is terrible. And it just left a lot of bad bad memories that I think I can do better. I know I can do better and I want to do yeah. better. And I want to go and show my family that, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I can do and they, they can be there and, and be a part of. I think those motivating factors are the, are the best ones. I think sometimes, you know, those things happen to you individually and you look back and you reflect to them and you might even think it's perhaps even the best thing that could happen to you because you don't know what motivating factor they'll give to you in the future. And obviously from the sounds of it, you're really motivated to, to prove <laughs> to prove yourself, which is a great thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it in general. It's a, it's a home Commonwealth Games as well. Like, There's a lot about home competition and family and friends who've followed for many years to have that opportunity to perform right in front of them because a lot of these events they happen all over the world and they obviously mean a lot to you but it's not always the easiest thing to follow whereas in case of the time trial it's quite literally 20 miles from my house so (laughs) i'm gonna have the biggest cheering squad (laughs) there and yeah i think it's it's fun to have those those kind of targets and uh yeah try and do something cool on on home ground Home, home field advantage is always a thing as well. Like you, you always feel, I think you always feel different. Like whether you played a home game or an away game, you you always feel different. There's so many little things I think that come into that. And just the familiar, the whole familiarity breeding confidence is, is a huge thing there. Yeah. And yeah. We've always, we've always done well when we're familiar with the, with the environment. And I think, um, yeah, there's, well, I mean, I'm trying to get familiar with it now. I've gone and moved <laughs> a bit far away. So even though I'd say it's home field, I'm now living in Andorra for, for the next few years. But um, I've ridden the course already. I'm going to be back and riding the course again quite a bit this year and really just become familiar with it. And with time trials especially, you need to be so confident in everything that's going to happen, how how fast you can take a corner, where, what your line should be, where you're going to look, and breaking all of that event down into meaningful bite-sized chunks that you can really address so it might be that i ride the course a few more times and go okay the big focus for me from a physiological perspective might be that i need to produce really high peak power for a few of the kickers because it's quite quite a rolling course and then i might also go okay from a technical perspective because it's quite rolling it's probably not going to be as fast so i probably need to spend a bit more time on my tire optimization and how should i go about approaching that so yeah just breaking the event down a little bit more and then how it all fits into my general calendar as well because it's all great saying i'm going to hit these three three big events but as an athlete you can't hold form for six weeks eight weeks and expect to to do three 
world class performances, you've got to be um, be intelligent about that. So um, there's a bit of planning to go into that and try and figure out how do I how do I break my own training down and my own general calendar and fit all my work in to make sure that I turn up at these events and I'm in a good good place. How how long are your training cycles then? Like how how long do you prepare for a, an event? Um, it does vary, definitely varies. So I was okay. quite lucky in that I had about a good six week block into what was the world champs in the hour record last year. Whereas for this this track champs, it's only about a three week block. So I um, have a good base consistency, I think, in my training mostly. Um, although there's always curveballs thrown in there. Oh, Dan, we want you to just fly out to whoever UAE <laughs> just <laughs> just for a few days all right um then yeah do you, you, do you, you get how do you manage your training though like when you're traveling like that do you do like bikes in the gym or do you take your own setup with you like how do you manage that oh it varies massively so i, I did five days in paris at, um a team conference at the end of last year and the gym bike was uh, you could barely call it a bike so i, I just went out <laughs> running <laughs> oh okay fair enough yeah 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 and I mean, I used to be a triathlete. I can run okay. Uh, so yeah, just did all I could for some physiological stimulus, hit the gym up a few times, keep on top of your flexibility. Just, I think it's doing the best you can in the situation that you're in yeah. because it, it's great going, I'm so frustrated. I, I wish I was on a training camp where everyone else is and doing all the, this great training, but you're not. And you've made the decision to be in that environment. So you, you make doing the best that is possible. And I have days as well. I, t- I might take my bike with me or the team might have a bike on the bus and, I can maybe do an hour turbo and then I might be mentally fatigued and all, all I can do is just soft tap for an hour and that's good enough. And you just have to accept that unfortunately some days aren't going to be perfect, mm. but it's doing the best you can within those days. One of the questions I really want to ask you is like about this technology, because you're like really interested in the engineering and the technology side and the optimization of the parts within the bike and, and, and the aerodynamics. How much do you think of like in the book you talked about, Robert, uh, banisters four minute mile and how much do you think the improvement in athletic performance is down to the technology and how much do you think is down to like the actual training because i wondered whether if for instance you took an athlete like roger banister and, and you put him in today's world with today's tracks and today's shoes and stuff how how good of an athlete he would be Hmm. It is an interesting question. So I think all sports sit on this um, spectrum that ha- you, you could go from human endeavor on one side all the way to purely technology on the other end. So maybe purely technology might be pretty much Formula One. If yeah. you don't have the car, you're not going to win. Yeah. And human endeavor, I mean, you, you, you could arguably say was running, was running. Um, and then a little bit in maybe swimming and Cycling, old schoolers tend to think it's more towards a human endeavor. People who actually understand the physics realize it's much more towards the technology end of the spectrum. So it's just that um, we have these kind of watershed moments in different sports when the penny drops and someone understands physics does apply to this sport and this is how it applies and how it can make a, a big leap forward. And swimming obviously had their, their speedo, what was it, swim skin, shark skin, suits whatever yeah. that was 10 15 years ago now it's a good while ago, it was ian wasn't thorpe it? wasn't it uh not ian thorpe is it ian thorpe was it the swimmer who was the first guy uh, to wear the swimsuit i can't remember but the times were tumbling weren't they it was like this mad acceleration and yeah. people were just going oh wow it does work and then obviously it's then got, they've been regulated against and times took a hit and they they then go back to how do we optimize within that and physiological training interventions etc and running because yeah chipped away little bit by little bit but um it's maybe something like one percent improvement over the last i think it's 10 or 15 years if you look at like a 1500 um whereas if you look at the, an equivalent event in cycling like the team pursuit it seemed like 15 percent reduction or something like that wow. so you can say well if we assume that the coaches and the nutritional interventions and the training interventions that you have on running and athletics are the same as you maybe get in cycling then technology makes up 14 of the 15 percent and maybe athletes the the one percent yeah but it it varies massively those numbers are kind of just yeah rough kind of outlines but um you can see that cycling is the kind of probably the extreme case whereas running yeah i think roger bannister could make a big big step forward how much from well with the new shoes who knows it seems to vary massively but um even if you take that away i think there's a lot that we've learned 
over those decades since he broke the four minute mile that would definitely yeah. help him to make those steps forward. And I think a lot of it just comes down to not making them, not having to make the mistakes, not having to learn from those falls because someone else has done it. Someone's written it down, put it in a book, or put it in a scientific paper that you shouldn't train like this. You shouldn't train like that. You shouldn't eat this. You shouldn't eat that. You should train like this and you should eat this. And then suddenly you don't have to make those mistakes throughout your athletic career to become good at the back end. You just get told and taught it from the outset. And that's why I think there's a lot of these called child prodigies coming through in all manner of sports because those lessons have been learned the hard way over years and years and years. And that, that knowledge is now starting to become more widespread rather than being held in small little training groups. The internet has, has obviously made yeah. it so much easier to get access to this information. And yeah. I think that's why all these sports are moving to having yeah, younger athletes who are incredibly, incredibly good because they've had all this support and this knowledge and the ability to, uh, to apply that over a long time for yeah. their entire careers so far and not have to make those mistakes. That seems, I think that seems to be happening in every single sport. Like you just see in cricket, you would see someone who comes out and they're like 16 or football, they're like 15 and they're playing in a professional team. And it's crazy to think that such strides can be made across different sports towards that. Yeah, uh, I think there's a question as well. At, at what level is it acceptable for, for 14, 15, 16 year olds to be playing professional sport? So I've always been an advocate for trying to, do other things in your life to, to have an education, to have a, a social life and to do everything else, especially when you're a teenager. I don't think you should miss out on those. They're, they're quite formative um, and not to spend all of that just training and just sitting around and recovering. But I think it, that, that comes down to regulations and legislation and all everything else of world governing bodies. And that's, that's not my field of expertise. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> my opinion is, um, and if you are your upcoming athlete listening to this, then diversify at the same time. Don't just focus on one sport because who knows, you might become injured or you might get bored in 10 years time mm -hmm. and having something else to fall back on or to do something different or just to keep you busy. Uh, I, do, I always say that um, elite athletes are the absolute best in the world at wasting time because they have to, because if you've got a training camp and you, you can only train so many hours in the day and your food's made for you, you sit around and you waste time and use that time. Time is a limited resource. And if that means you've got some little side business or some other interest or whatever it might be, it, it could just be reading books. Those are cool books because you pick up so many great ideas through reading, but it might be, yeah, setting up a business. It might be, could be anything really there's there's plenty of things out Learning there new but... skills there's so many there's so many things you can do like i always think about footballers actually like it's one of my things thinking about it is like footballers because i would love to be a footballer purely because you have so much resource money wise you have the training facilities you have all that type of stuff and then you have the time like there'd be so much there'd be so much i'd love to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's crazy isn't it you've got the time the money and the opportunity, if you're willing to go for it, like there's so much that could be done. But um, I don't know. I I'll just the ignore the fact that I have no football ability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want to be paid tens of millions of pounds to just yeah. kick a ball about all year? Obviously, there's a lot more to it there. Obviously. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I, I just encourage a lot of upcoming younger athletes to, to just try and use their time wisely because there's so much more. To, to life than riding a bike or kicking a ball or swimming yeah. it's there's there's so much more that you can do and you're, you're only an athlete for a short amount of time like you might retire especially in some higher impact sports in your 30s yeah definitely. and then hopefully that means you've got another 30 40 years of doing cool stuff so yeah, definitely yeah you touched upon it quickly just just then about books and and your love for reading like i'd just love to end talking about some of your favorites like the books that you've really read that's had an impact on you perhaps to improve your performance cycling or to really help you in your you know other other pursuits whether it be engineering or otherwise uh, i read a lot but i'd say mostly um non-fiction so my partner joss is a keen reader of all things fiction she loves um world war one world war two that kind of stuff so we can never really talk about the same books but um everything around high performance habits uh even like for, for example atomic habits i think is quite popular at the moment i've just been been listening to that and found that quite helpful uh, especially because i'm in a new environment now and i've just gone it's a really good point that i can actually use this new environment to create new habits because you suddenly break all your old habits because you're in yeah. a situation where you're no longer tied to that, that location. So the, that's been quite an interesting one right now because 
I know I need to, there are, there was always bad habits as much as, <laughs> as, much as you want to change them. It's, it's yeah. pretty hard. So that's been a good one. Um, I tend to listen to loads of things around um, the psychology of stuff. So uh, the marshmallow test, um, mm. why we yeah. sleep, mm. uh, what else have I been doing? Um, Utopia for realists was quite yeah. a fun one. Um, I'm not, into I say I can't say I'm not into politics. I enjoy following politics. I'm definitely not a politician by any stretch. But uh that was quite a fun one. And I think it, it definitely aligned with me quite a bit on how I should uh think about the world and influence the world because yeah, I don't have a massive impact, but I should do all I can to create those kind of utopic environments. Um yeah. but so we'll listen to Steve Ingham, uh a lot of his books, so is always been about elite sport and how you should work with elite athletes and that's just always been been inspirational and last year I ended up on his podcast which was like life ambition <laughs> it was really cool. like dream fulfilled uh, roughly yeah just that I'd say that was probably yeah the uh one of the most influential books um that I must have read back in 2015 2016 just when these kind of ideas were were yeah. coming into my head and start to seed some thoughts around how I should should go about it oh nice that's a good selection of books that I appreciate you sharing those. Um, anyway, Den, thank you so much for the time for coming on the podcast and, and discussing elements from your book and your story as well. Um, your book is uh, Start at the End, How Reverse Engineering Can Lead to Success, the book right here. Yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> it's actually uh, got a new cover coming out because it comes oh, out does it? back in a few few weeks time. Oh, nice. So it's a different cover coming. Nice. Exciting. If anyone doesn't like that one, they can get the other one. <laughs> <laughs> thank um, you for having me on. You're welcome. Uh, where's the best place that individuals can find you, whether it be uh, a website site or social media uh so i'm pretty much on everything instagram twitter uh dan bigham or dan biggles uh or if you search dan bigham on google normally i pop up or my website shop for watts uh which if you want to sign a copy of my book you can get one from there there you go um but yeah feel free anybody who's interested or wants to ask a question i'm, I'm always really open so yeah send me a, a tweet or a dm or whatever works for you perfect thanks so thanks so much dan cheers thank you Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I really hope you took away some amazing points from the conversation that I had with Dan. Dan is a very interesting personality, someone who is uh, engineering minded, but also athletically has athletic pursuits as well. And I definitely think that speaking to people like that is very inspiring because you can learn that there is more that you can do and there's always more that you can do there's more that you can learn there's more that you can grow both athletically and also with your studies and things that you want to learn as well so thank you dan for coming on the podcast it was really interesting conversation that i had with you and best of luck with your cycling championships as well as I said at the beginning of this podcast, if you haven't subscribed already, please do. Every single week, release a podcast with an author to discuss their book, as well as the ideas and principles inside of it. We've got some really interesting podcasts lined up for the next couple of months. So definitely hit that subscribe button, whether you're listening to this on Apple, Spotify or YouTube. Thanks for subscribing and thank you again for listening to this podcast. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.